everybody. Kim is on an airplane today, so it's just me and just us. I actually don't have a quote for today yet, but I'm sure one will occur to us. I guess the place to start is getting used to doing the impossible. Yesterday, I saw a patient that comes in once every, I guess the first time I saw him was October, and he has very advanced MS. He has only the use of his left hand to use a joystick. Legs don't work at all. <clears throat> his trunk didn't used to work. His right hand started out with about five pounds of grip strength at the end of the first treatment in October. It was eight, 10 pounds. And he's been doing a lot of work with Joe Dispenza, visualizing, healing old emotional trauma, getting his personal, spiritual self organized, healed from the inside. So there's a sign that I have that says the soul moves first. <clears throat> so we treated with a frequency for central and peripheral myelin, which are experimental. And then frequencies for inflammation and torn and broken and repairing DNA and concussion in Vegas and TTH and emotional frequencies to help him on his internal journey. And I think sometime around the second session I had with him, I said, you're doing the most important part. Ultimately, we'll get to a point where it actually doesn't matter whether or not the MS goes away because you will have healed the inside of you. <clears throat> but because of the work he's been doing with Joe Dispenza, and I've got to learn more about what this guy does, this patient has stood up 28 times. First time he just stood up twice in one of these week-long workshops. And then the second time he stood up 28 times and then another 10 times at home after he got back. And yesterday I treated him, same thing. Only this time, instead of neck to hands, because all he wanted at first was for his hands to work, we treated neck to feet and neck to his right hand. Now, at the beginning of the session, his right hand was 10 pounds. At the end of the session, his right hand was 14 pounds. And his left hand, which started out at 15 last October, was 53. None of this is possible in conventional therapy. He's on an uh, immune suppressant. He didn't want to be on it. And I said, there's no reason not to. Let's use all the tools in the toolbox. <clears throat> and last night he emailed me and said, I made a peanut butter sandwich. Now it's the little things in life. I didn't know that making a peanut butter sandwich was one of his goals. They don't tell you about the little ones. But I got an email that said, I was able to spread the peanut butter on the bread, use both hands, and eat a peanut butter sandwich. Can't move his legs. He said, but they feel different. I can feel energy moving in them. and. You just get used to doing the impossible. That's part of FSM. There's one other thing that happened yesterday that's worth talking about because it applies to everybody that's listening. So my practice partner had a new patient <clears throat> and the patient wanted to meet me. So I went in the treatment room. Patient was all excited. She's a, a retired nurse. She sat up, we started talking, and something about 
what she was saying about her symptoms made me ask Sandra, what was the tuning fork like? When you put the tuning fork on her forehead, what was it? Sandra looked in her notes and she said she only heard it in the left ear. And I went, it lateralized? I said, what was her fields of gaze? She said, oh, I didn't do them. No to everyone. If you put a tuning fork in the middle of someone's head and they only hear it on one side, the next step is fields of gaze. So we did that and her right eye bounced. Definite saccades, right? It bounced. And then the next question was, how do you feel when you go into Costco? What kind of stores do you shop in? He said, oh, I totally can't go into Costco and I can't go into the big Fred Meyers, but I can go into the little one that's near my house. So you have two of the things that you need for um, a vestibular diagnosis. Then I went and got the BIVS, Brain Injury Visual System Symptom Questionnaire, the 18 question version. And sure enough, her score was 29. So then we started talking about the symptoms of vestibular injuries. And she went, that's why I feel anxious. That's why last week was good. And this Monday was horrible. And yeah, that's why. Once you recognize what it is, then it becomes a management problem. We talked about meclizine. And she said, you mean meclizine would have helped on Monday when I just felt awful and wanted to stay in bed? I said, yeah, that would do it. And then the next stop, because she's local, is Dr. Now, the symptom that bothered her was this feeling of fuzziness that came up over her head and down under her jaw. <clears throat> and I had her tip her head back. Yes, that made it worse. So then we went into the other room and we looked at the sclerotomal chart that was on the wall. And her pattern was the exact pattern for the C12 facet. And then we talked about our auto accident and found the disbulge at 5.6 and explained what facets do. And she has a lumbar disc that's giving her radiculopathies at four or five in S1. Lumbar spine has a disc bulge. C-spine has a disc bulge. I said, did you have an accident? She said, yeah, about four or five years ago. And I broke my sternum on the steering wheel. Okay. And then as we're checking out, she said, yeah, my favorite thing is rowing. So she has a skull and she goes on the river and she rows. She said, and I have to turn and look behind me. She demonstrated turning and looking behind her. And her thoracic spine did not move. Her neck moved, her thoracic spine moved as a block, but the point of rotation was L3, 4, and 5. The lumbar spine shears because the thoracic spine is immobile. And I said, you broke your sternum and we found the fracture line was right up here. So between the clavicle and the T2 rib was fine but we went to the space of the T3 and T4 rib and they were exquisitely painful. Okay, how do I know this? When I blew the discs in my neck and prior to that, when I blew the discs in my low back, the physical therapists that I work with at New Heights, the first thing they worked on was the scar tissue in my chest from open heart surgery. I said, what? Why are you starting in my thoracic spine? Your thoracic spine has to rotate. See, I can do this now. My lumbar spine isn't moving, right? Your thoracic spine has to rotate the whole thing stepwise. 
or the discs above it and the discs below it shear because the trunk doesn't rotate. Does that make sense? The me mechanics of it? So this is the thing that's different with FSM practitioners is we have to think through things. And I was taught by all the injuries that I had, which is makes them a blessing, actually. I told the lady, you need to see Sandra twice a week for two weeks. Then you'll see Dr. Rusky. Two weeks after that, you'll get your glasses. Once you get your glasses, the muscles in your neck will relax and it will stop jamming the facets. So that will make this easier. And then the next two visits will be to get your trunk moving. And her eyes got big because we are a cash only practice. Sandra's $150 an hour, which I think is cheap. But anyway, $150 an hour. And I said, this is eight weeks. You've been like this for six years. This will be done in eight weeks. If your car needed a brake job, you pay for the brake job. Get your thoracic spine moving, work supine cervical practicum, put one unit on subacute disc, one unit from low back to feet for 40 and 396 treating inflammation in the nerve, get rid of the nerve pain in your legs, get your trunk moving, get your facets quieted down. Once you get your prism glasses, the neck muscles will relax and the compression on your facets will end your discs in your neck. That'll settle down because your neck muscles are tight because your brain doesn't know where it is in space because you have a vestibular injury. And all of this started with the tuning fork in the middle of her head. Sandra always does a complete exam. So you always test hearing as part of the cranial nerve exam. But once the tuning fork in the middle of the forehead lateralizes to take the next step and do a vestibular screen, and the BIVSS, and there was a com the comment she made that made me go looking for the vestibular injury had something to do, I think, with either balance or anxiety, dizziness, disequilibrium, that kind of thing. So you, it's these little breadcrumbs that patients leave and little things that you find in the history, her life is never gonna be the same. It's gonna cost her a $1,500 about a break job, maybe a transmission, I don't know. And it'll be done. She'll have her life back. She'll be able to go sculling on the river without cranking up nerve pain in her legs or cranking up that paresthesias in her head. That's what we get to do. I'm so excited. Okay, let me do questions. Okay, Rick, you're going to have to tell me more about your frozen shoulder. Dana, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. The woman in is 45 years old, says it is a late onset condition where she can't even take turmeric. Not sure how it develops, why there's a respiratory reaction to aspirin, pain meds, not technically an allergy. FSM pain protocols might worsen the condition or help. She can take Tylenol and acetaminophen. If you do 23andMe, <clears throat> and then we sent my 23andMe to interpretation site called NutraHacker, and there's a SNP, was way down towards the bottom called SOD2. And it leads to early hearing loss. But the major problem is that you can't metabolize NSAIDs. So aspirin is an NSAID. The challenge, I've never heard it exacerbating respiratory disease. But if you think about it, it actually makes sense. 
The challenge with aspirin and NSAIDs is that they block prostaglandins, right? Now there's the prostaglandins that create inflammation and there's the prostaglandins that rebuild your stomach lining, that rebuild the lining of your blood vessels. There's prostaglandins that help maintain a pregnancy. There's prostaglandins that probably help do something to the lining of the bronchi. Not sure what it does, but you could probably Google it if you put in prostaglandins and respiratory disease, also called whatever. Somebody, they have to give it a name, but this is the thing that aspirin and turmeric and Advil have in common is that they block prostaglandins. There has to be a prostaglandin that's associated with sensitivity in the bronchi and NSAIDs block that prostaglandin. It's gotta be there. What I would do is open up my phone and look it up and there will be an NIH paper on prostaglandins and the bronchi. It's a genetic SNP that makes you sensitive to NSAIDs. In me, it led to early hearing loss. And I am really sensitive to Advil. After surgery, I won't let them give me Toradol because it makes me bleed, makes my gut bleed. If I, they gave me a leave after a surgery and I completely lost my hearing for about four days, that was pretty awful. So there are certain genetic SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms that make you intolerant to NSAIDs. And that's what she's got. So if you want to prove it, 23andMe, I like NutraHacker. It's not the sexiest one. People seem to prefer other ones. But NutraHacker is the only interpretation site that has demonstrated this particular SNP plus a whole bunch of other ones that I have. That's what I do. And see if she has an SOD2 or another SNP that makes her sensitive to NSAIDs. I don't know a solution for it, except don't take NSAIDs. Don't take aspirin, don't take Advil. FSM is not going to make it worse because while we lower lipoxygenase and cyclooxygenase, we do reduce prostaglandins dramatically, 62% in LOX and 30% in COX. It's temporary, right? So the problem with NSAIDs is it chemical and it lasts six hours. FSM lowers it, drops it a lot, and then allows it to come back up. So that's why I think we're able to use the frequency 40 and 116, which is what they used in the mice. You can use 40 and almost anything. It's going to reduce inflammation in that tissue, but it doesn't last as long as it probably doesn't use the same mechanism as NSAIDs. So the reason that NSAIDs give you ulcers and damage your kidneys is that the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories block the prostaglandins that rebuild the blood vessel wall lining. That's why Celebrex has a black box warning on it about cardiovascular disease. And they block the prostaglandins that rebuild your gut wall, which is why you get ulcers, which is also why coated aspirin makes no sense because... It's not like the aspirin lands in your stomach and causes an ulcer by topical effect. Aspirin, Advil cause GI problems because they block the prostaglandins that rebuild your gut wall. Gut walls, your stomach is full of acid. So it has to be rebuilt like on a regular basis. And if you block the prostaglandin that rebuilds your gut wall, then you're going to get ulcers. So yes, you should be able to use 40 and just about anything. We've never given anybody ulcers 
we've never upset anybody's stomach. See, once they give it a name, like aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, they just stop thinking. Once they name the disease without thinking about where it comes from, I don't understand that. It's like, You have to look at what NSAIDs, aspirin, Advil, Aleve, Celebrex, what do they do? They block prostaglandins. Then you look up prostaglandins and find out what the prostaglandins do. So that's how you think about it. And you can look it all up these days. Back when I first ran into this stuff, Google was not a big thing. And I spent a lot of time in the medical school library. So now it's easy. Okay, Janet Eng, what are you doing to heal DNA? In the Solfeggio frequencies, there is a frequency, I think it's 528, it's on the advanced list. There's a frequency that says love and miracles repair DNA. The Solfeggio frequencies, I'm not fully committed to that they actually work. But if you remember seven years ago, a spinal muscular atrophy, Christine Allcroft presented a case report on an SMA patient who is 18 months old. Spinal muscular atrophy is a genetic double recessive, and it blocks the enzyme that um, allows your spinal cord to work, motor pathways to work. So these kids are floppy, can't hold themselves up, can't walk, can't use their arms. Um, they die by a very young age, usually by 13, 14, 15. And Dr. Alcroft used this repair DNA in the spinal cord, in increased secretions in the spinal cord, I think you'll have to look up her case report. And then she has video of this child being completely floppy. And then each treatment, eventually the kid is sitting up at a table using his arms to color with. So that was 528. I'm pretty sure that's the one. Let me get my buddy out because I just had to look this up this morning. Yep, 528. It's off the Solfeggio list. Okay, anonymous. Oh, that answers Alf's question too. It's really good to see you guys. Hi, everybody. All right, anonymous, sensitive subject matter. 86-year-old cancer patient on hospice care at home and on several pain management prescriptions of recently committed suicide as he was so irritated and in pain, developing incontinence, hard to swallow, losing autonomy, didn't want to burden his family. Is there a place for FSM to ease the pain and emotional turmoil for people in this situation? Wow. Yeah. Obviously, we don't treat cancer, but we can treat the pain associated with cancer. There's a protocol for bone metastasis, and it sounds like he had mets. So you can use that protocol to keep bone mets down. The challenge with bone mets is that regular pain meds don't do a very good job of dealing with bone mets. And pain from the tumor, we have enough practitioner case reports where the patient was a family member. They used 40 Hertz and 20 Hertz, reduce inflammation and then reduce pain reaction in the organ that has cancer to keep the pain from the tumor down. And the other thing that happens as you're approaching death, if you watch the slow process, or if you've ever been around people that are in hospice, the whole autonomic nervous system is set up to keep you alive. So as systems start shutting down, the midbrain gets more and more anxious 
more and more sympathetically driven. So that was the irritation, harder to swallow. That suggests maybe there were metastasis to the brain that affected something incontinence. That's certainly not easy. We dealt with that a lot. George was in Depends for the last three months just because we couldn't get him to into the bathroom. It was just too dangerous to get him up. And losing autonomy, that's a tough one on everybody, the people that care for him as well as the patient. So there are processes. And in general, the nervous system becomes more irritable. It's hospice patients have a lot of trouble with anxiety. So the two medications that they brought George were oral morphine and oral librium. So to reduce the anxiety and morphine reduces the air hunger. So as they lose motor ability, it's more difficult to breathe and the reduction in oxygen saturation creates anxiety. Once again, it's in the membrane, it's the survival centers. So yes, there's a place for FSM. You can reduce the pain and that can actually prolong life. We have some anecdotal case reports on that. Treating bone mats, that's another thing. You can run probably the emotional protocols, that I would guess. 40 and 562, quiet the sympathetics. Concussion protocol, quiet the medulla because the medulla and the midbrain are the two that, that's the most primitive part of the brain. So you're going to quiet that. And then after the person dies, it's really a good idea to ha have the family members treated with concussion and concussion in Vegas. PTSD takes two hours. I have a vague feeling that concussion in Vegas is going to do a very similar thing. So there's two ways to do this. One is to make sure that hospice is there with the medications that make this easier. We treated George somewhat, just concussion in Vegas pretty constantly on his picture or with a converter. and it didn't slow the process. Like none of us are getting out of this live, right? Making the transition as comfortable and smooth as possible is one of the goals. So I guess that's what you would do and then treat the family afterwards. In Oregon, where I live or used to live, there is an assisted suicide law that allows physicians to prescribe a lethal dose of something, but the patient has to apply for that once they get a terminal diagnosis while they're still cognitively intact. They have to have, and then they get the prescription and they can take it anytime they want. I, and then because of my spiritual belief system, I might have a different approach to this than other people do, but yeah. Committed suicide. You might want to think of that as he, oh, gunshot. That's hard. That's not doing it with drugs. Texas, ick. Okay. I'm just going to keep quiet about that one. We all do better if I stay out of politics and stick to what I'm good at. Move to Oregon. Good plan. I don't know what the hospice regulations are in Texas. The hospice in Oregon and Washington are the only ones I'm familiar with. And the standard hospice liquid medications are morphine, Librium. For the two months before he died, our GP told us to give George CBD in the daytime and CBN at night to help him sleep and CBD in the daytime to reduce inflammation, keep him physically comfortable. He wasn't in any pain. And it reduced the anxiety and kept him emotionally calmer. But at night, they do something called sundowning. At night, it's just very difficult for them. Okay, 
Impossible frozen shoulder. Okay, DNA, Rick Allen. I don't know how to do that, Rick. And frozen shoulders, frozen shoulder. Kathleen Kasman, how nice to see you. Janet, oh, look at all these familiar names. Debbie Allen, Danielle, cool. Hi, everybody. Mary, okay. All right, Denise. Rick, here's the thing with imp impossible frozen shoulders. You start with the subscap, you start with the capsule, and it actually depends on what caused it to freeze. So if it was a fracture that bled, that pouch at the bottom of the capsule, the bleeding has fibrosis and it just sticks. So that's one cause. Torn tendon, bleeding, right? It sticks. The general female 40 inflamed person where it just gets inflamed and stuck, that's frozen shoulder. In our world, we do the subscap, we do the pec minor, and we treat the joint capsule and mobilize it. And I usually give them about three to four weeks. They have to do cotton to stretch the capsule. They have to do those painful wall walking exercises that the PTs have them use. And even then, it's entirely possible they end up having a surgical repair of the frozen shoulder try and get the surgeon not to take off the end of the acromion because it never works and then treat them after the surgery as a new injury as a post-operative shoulder protocol and it's frozen shoulder for me anyway is not a slam dunk i have practitioners that have a better chance with it than i do let's see i hope that helps Denise had a client come in today for a massage that was stressed out. Massages are good for that. So I offered a massage with FSM. She felt every single setting change on both custom cares, concussion in Vegas, constipation. Some made her tingly, others pulse. She could feel stronger at the towel on the neck than the one on her back. Some frequencies caused anxiety and none calmed her. So she had lots of recent traumas coming again in the morning. Should I do TTH? TTH isn't a bad idea, but the thing to do is a vestibular screen. So if you ran concussion in Vegas, concussion protocol, I have two versions. One is concussion in Vegas minus 94 and 94. So if I have not done vestibular screen on a patient, I'll automatically run the one without 94 and 94. That one makes people anxious and it is persistent. If she has a vestibular injury, she'll come in tomorrow morning and still be anxious, maybe even nauseous. I'll try that and you can try TTH, but the other thing to do is 40 on A and 44 on B, 40 on A and 94 on B, quiet the inner ear and quiet the medulla and see if that helps. The other thing is, if it's possible to get in touch with the patient, have her try meclizine as a way, just it's over the counter. Tell her sometimes that helps. I don't know what your scope of practice is in Oregon. I can recommend OTC drugs. You can say something like, when I felt like that, I tried meclizine and it made it better. If it helps, then you know that she reacted to 94 and 94. Uh, TTH is always helpful. It's we're surrounded with negative critters, entities, however you want to call them, that have. Scope is just massage. So you can't tell her to take meclizine, but you might mention that when you felt like that, you took it. And is she willing to try it? The other thing you can do is just 40 and 44. 
quiet the inner ear, quiet the medulla, and see what happens. All right. Anonymous, you're back. With your wealth of experience, thank you very much. Could you please refresh us the list that you and Kim have been advising us to consider backing out of in reverse order when treating painful tissue like the nerve? Inflammation leads to, in the core seminar, there's this set of slides. So inflammation leads to chronic inflammation, which is also called depot bruise. We don't use that one so much anymore, but that leads in all tissues to calcium influx. Inflammation leads to calcium influx in the brain, in the fascia, in the blood vessels, everything. So that leads to calcium influx. That leads to fibrosis. That leads to scarring. So that's the sequence. And you can treat scarring in any tissue because they any tissue that has had blood around it, like that lady with the broken sternum, there's bleeding, fractures cause bleeding, which is why if Rick's patient has a frozen shoulder that was caused by a fracture, there was blood, there's scar tissue, it's really dense. I don't think you're gonna get it with FSM, but that's another conversation. Anyway, back to anonymous. So you, can treat scar tissue, let's say in the nerve, but the nerve is so inflamed that you're not gonna be able to touch it enough to remove the scar tissue. So you have one machine running on inflammation in the nerve, and then the other one running on scarring while you're mobilizing it. Calcium influx in nerves in the brain, for example, the calcium displaces magnesium, I think, on the NMDA receptor. And that's part of what leads to dementia. So in the advanced now, there's this whole section on how you treat cognitive decline and how you think about Alzheimer's. And it's all the frequencies that we have thinking in this progression. So you can start at this end and go that way, so inflammation leads to calcium influx, leads to fibrosis, leads to necrosis, leads to degeneration, leads to necrosis, leads to, and I always start at this end, where did it start? And then treat what that caused. I don't exactly do it in reverse order. Well, except reverse order is what you feel is scar tissue here reverse order would be what caused it, right? That was interesting. I hope that helps. BPPV, UG, Epley Maneuver works. John Epley practiced here in Portland. He treated my son's swimmers here. And I said, thanked him for seeing us. And he said, I'm just glad to see somebody that's not dizzy. So he took care of Adam's swimmers here in about 20 minutes. Believe it or not, I've got to be the only chiropractor in the country that doesn't know how to do the Epley maneuver. And so I don't treat BPPV mostly because I've never seen it. I've always been to somebody else. And so for me, I got Meniere's. And the Epley maneuver wouldn't have done me any good because what I did was blow out the endolymphatic sac. That was acute peroxis dizziness on an airplane. And my solution was to meclizine and go to sleep for three hours. And then when I woke up, the dizziness was gone. So I wish I was better at that, Dana, but I'm not. Yeah. So I guess my, my solution is meclizine if I don't know how to do the Epley maneuver. All right. Yeah. I Different maneuvers called Epley. John Apley's retired, so just try one of the different ones. Here we go, Rick. November of 22, comminuted fracture. I had a feeling. No treatments until seeing me. Seriously? Nobody treated? Okay, this is the part where I just have to. It's been a year. No, it hasn't. It's only been six months. But it seems like after the 
upper humerus, it would have bled into the capsule. Yeah, it's not going to be emotional. Not going to be 81 and 92. No. Nope. Yeah, PT exercises. Oh, 45 to 80 degrees in 10 visits, but it's stuck now. Yeah, the fracture bled into the capsule and you're stuck. So the question is, what's her goal? Does she want to get to, what is that? If that's 90, that's 180. Does she want to get to 180? Is she happy at 80? If she's 74, the surgery is going to be really hard on her and it's no guarantee it's going to work. It will be more effective if you can get your hands on her within four hours of the time of the surgery. So you can keep chipping away at it a degree at a time, still doing exercises. If she seriously wants to avoid the surgery, just keep mobilizing the joint because you're a chiropractor. You're in scarring in the joint capsule and stretch it from A to P. So you get just lateral to the acromion and gently mobilize the capsule from front to back and from top to bottom and just keep at stretching the capsule. Coordinating movement, as long as the capsule's stuck, the cerebellum and the sensory motor cortex are not going to let you move the muscles. So your solution is somebody that knows how to mobilize the joint is to mobilize the joint while you're running scarring. You might also try 54 and the capsule that's necrosis, degeneration, 58. 217 and a 74 year old, 91 is not hard enough. It 217 is ankylosis and it's a mineral that works better in older patients. So I tried 217 and the joint capsule, scarring in the joint capsule, 58 in the joint capsule, which is degeneration, 54 is necrosis. Maybe five, even 528, because you're, you're looking at a joint capsule that now no longer thinks of itself as a joint capsule, if you want to anthropomorphize it. Kathleen, I have to get back to North Carolina. Oh, we, speaking of getting back to anywhere, you guys get to come here next year for seminars. We just signed a lease on the wonderful space at the end of the hallway right next to the clinic. And it's like the perfect seminar room. And then you get to come into the clinic and, oh, she fights. Wait, then let me finish the sentence. Then Rick, don't go away. So we'll do the seminars in this great room at the end of the hallway. Everybody gets to go downstairs and get whatever kind of food they want. They've got a taco shop here there's pizza place across the way great burgers down the street italian food sushi although the sushi place i'm not sure is open for lunchtime and then i'm probably going to take everybody to dinner at edgefield on saturday night and maybe we can if i rent a room we can use the hot tub that could be really fun they have a hot tub that's like a lazy river sort of thing all sorts of possibilities but it means I'm not traveling to do seminars, which means all sorts of good things can happen. I'm excited, which means I'm not going to be in um, North Carolina, Kathleen. Maybe we'll have you come here. All right, Rick, she fights movement. Yeah. So when you're running anything, so she being the lady with the frozen shoulder, when you're running anything for the capsule, you have to wait. So you run the frequency, apply pressure to the capsule, wait, 1,001, 1,002, and it will soften a millimeter at a time, tiny bit. And then you take advantage, press that one millimeter, 
And then as soon as it tightens up, you have to stop or she's going to fight it. That's the brain. She doesn't get to vote. She doesn't fight it. The brain does. Is yep, nope. You're going to tear something if you keep going. So you wait. Change your vector. Wait till it softens. Press a little bit in that direction. Change vector. Wait. Press a millimeter. So when you're dealing with scarred tissue, the trick is to wait until it softens and then mobilize it until it gets stiff again and then stop. Wait, change the vector. And it's a millimeter at a time, especially if it's yours, you're in this place, Rick. Sign you up for Trap Dale. It'll be fun. I am so excited. I think spending the night in the Denver airport was the end and then paying the hotel bill for the Denver hotel was the other part of the and what is your personal wait list right now I think Susan's booking into December movie producer has some mysterious issues that are yet undiagnosed burns the candle at both ends kind of guy everybody I know that's in theater and film is like that it's just part of how they're built but have them call the clinic and Susan has a wait list and is scheduling people I think into I don't get back from uh, Taiwan until November 15th anyway I'm looking over at Kevin November 15th Sunday let's because we leave Taiwan. We fly from Taiwan back to Sydney and then from Sydney, then spend the Monday night in Sydney, then fly home Tuesday. We leave at noon in Sydney and get back into San Francisco at seven o'clock in the morning, five hours before we left. It's changing date lines is really hilarious. And Derek Nakamura, just so everybody knows, we are leaving for Hawaii on Saturday. The core seminar is Monday through Friday, so we have the weekend to play, and uh, we still have room in that class. Kevin's all worried because it's a smallish sort of class. I'm excited. I love doing seminars in Hawaii anyway, so we do a core for five days in this really cool hotel in downtown Kona, and then we're doing a master class for five days at Derek's retreat center, and that's about 15 minutes from the best snorkeling and the most sacred spot on the entire Hawaiian islands called Hono now. The name is a lot longer than that, but all I can remember to say is Hono. And it is, there's a temple there that dates back to what, 1500s, 1600s? At least it's been in the same place for that long. And we still have space. And I bought a new mask and snorkel and got some new booties and then found out that my new booties didn't fit in my old fins. So I got a new pair of pen, fins and I got a swim shirt that comes with SPV 50, SPF 50. So excited. I get to go snorkeling because the master class is from nine to one. And that means you have the afternoon to do whatever you want in Kona. And there's a bunch of beaches that are really nice. Okay. Two weeks ago, 75-year-old e-bike. Oh, no. It's Kathleen. Fell on Joe's right lateral leg, urgent care, no fracture, but bank, ankle sprain, distal fibular bone bruise. Doing better, dorsum of foot. Nighttime, I'm treating nerve to help him sleep. Thanks for being you and teaching me. Thanks for doing what you do. That's the other thing you guys need to know is that uh, I'm just persistent when it comes to teaching and showing up. But all that we've done is only possible because you guys use it. That's the best part. Tell Joe I'm really sorry. Treat the bone bruise for acute fracture, for sure. And then the edema is just inflammation and swelling and the lymphatics getting overwhelmed. <sighs> E-bikes. Yes, 
Kevin is making noises about e-bikes. All right. We have one minute left. I don't have a magic quote. What is our favorite quote? I guess my favorite quote is, everything is going to be OK. And I have this set of rules. I've been watching NCIS, so I figured I should put my rules in some sort of order. Rule number one is there's uh, always a win solution where everybody gets something. Rule number six is be a student of easy. <laughs> there we go. Dana, life is like a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. I like that. That's a good way to end it. Derek's coming to Troutdale too. Outstanding. The other thing I promise is that at some point we are going to make as a separate video segment how to diagnose what the hints are in the history, how to diagnose and approach vestibular injuries. And the other is how to implement FSM into a practice or challenge with doing that in any given class. Number one, if I put anything more in the course seminar, your brain is going to explode. But number two, everybody has such a different practice. We have massage therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, naturopaths, nurse practitioners, psychiatric nurse practitioners, MDs, naturopaths, osteopaths, chiropractors. I always forget somebody. So if I forgot your profession, sorry about that. But implementing it is just really different. So that's part of what we'll do when we start having the core for new people and repeat people. If you haven't taken the core in the last five years, you got to retake it because it's completely different. And we'll do the seminar in the really pretty vaulted ceiling, wonderful acoustics room at the end of the hallway. And then you'll be able to see how we've set up the different rooms in the clinic and you get to see the gym. So there you go. Four o'clock. It is time to go. And the other thing to say to you is enjoy life and do good things. Oh, for the next couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. The next couple of weeks. We are all going to be in Hawaii. So uh, we are going, Kevin is going to replay the two podcasts that had the highest viewership. I think that's how he's going to do it because he keeps track of those metrics. We won't be here to record. We aren't going to be here to record. So there won't be live Q&A and it will be two reruns until we get back from Hawaii. And I'm going to be all suntanned and relax. So that should be fun. Mary Hostetler, thank you very much. I still have my coin. I carry it with me just in case because you never know. Okay. Do good things, change lives, change the world. Love ya. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.